Uh, welcome everybody to the uh, CNS Journal Club podcast. Uh, this is the April edition. Uh, it's going to be a, a unique topic. Uh, the title of the paper uh, that we'll be reviewing is on-call junior neurosurgery residents spend nine hours of their on-call shift actively using the electronic health record. Uh, with me, we have a few uh, uh, special uh, guests. Uh, is the author, Anthony, uh, from UCSF. Uh, you want to go ahead and introduce yourself for the group? Sure. My name is Anthony DiGiorgio. I'm an assistant professor of neurosurgery at UCSF. I'm also affiliated faculty at the Institute for Health Policy Studies at UCSF. Awesome. Welcome to the uh, podcast. Uh, as always, we have a guest faculty. Uh, today, we have Teresa from MGH. You want to introduce yourself? Sure. I'm Teresa Williamson. I'm a neurosurgeon and assistant professor at Mass General, and I do my research in the Harvard Center for Bioethics, where I study patient-physician communication and also surgeon well-being. Amazing. <laughs> Welcome. And uh, our resident uh, guest is uh, one of our uh, regulars for the CNS podcast, and that's Brian. Uh, you want to introduce yourself? Yeah, uh, my name is Brian Sawe. I'm a uh, third year resident at Medical University of South Carolina. Um, just a little bit of background. I have um, been doing some research um, and working with the CNS Wellness and Resilience Committee, uh, looking at uh, burnout and resilience and ways to increase performance in, in our uh, neurosurgical community. So I thought this, this, uh, this manuscript here was very appropriate and something worth discussing. Yeah, well, thank you so much. So we'll go ahead and get uh, things kicked off with Anthony. Go ahead and uh, give us a little background about the uh, paper, you know, what you found, and, and mainly for me, uh, what inspired this study. Yeah, well, thanks for having me on to talk about this, and I, I appreciate the comments about our work. I'm pretty excited about this project, and, and what really inspired it was, you know, I, I was a resident not too long ago, and I, I remember really feeling a bit overwhelmed and pinned down by the electronic health record. And when I got to UCSF, I noticed it was really the same issue in our residents. Um, and when I had the opportunity to join the Institute for Health Policy Studies, there's a few people uh, in that institute who specialize in clinical informatics. And we spoke about pulling the EMR data uh, for our residents. As I've seen this, there's a few other studies that have looked at it in, in other specialties, but no one had really looked at it at neurosurgery. Um, and so it, it turned out to be pretty simple to, to pull the EHR data and be able to see where, uh, how much time the residents were spending on the HR in their on-call shift. <clears throat> we wanted to focus on the on-call shift because in talking to the residents, that's where they really felt that they spent the most time kind of pinned down to the EHR. Um, and it was really easy to, to just quantify uh, that period of time. And so we were able to pull their, their uh, logs. Basically, we, we had their total logged in time, which started when they badged into a workstation the clock would start and then we'd stop the clock when they badged out. And we were really careful if, if they walked away and stopped working and, and the computer either timed out or they logged in somewhere else, we excluded that time. So it was really only, you know, log in, stop working and log out time. And then active time was time actually in a patient chart, which within the electronic health record system, when the, when the uh, user was actually clicking the mouse or using the keyboard. Um, <clears throat> and so if they're doing specific tasks, we could actually see what they were doing in the EHR. Um, notably, the active time doesn't account for things like looking at images and packs um, or, say, compiling patient lists in an external uh, word processor, doing patient-related emails, things like that. So we found that the residents were over a, a call shift, which we counted as a 24-hour uh, in-house call shift, plus we allowed a little bit of extra time for that ACG, ACGME allotment for uh, continuity of care uh, activities. So we looked at about a 28-hour shift. Um, and found that over that, that time period, patients were logged in for about 20 hours, and they were actively using the EMR for about nine of those 20 hours. So <clears throat> we figured the actual time of EMR usage is somewhere probably closer to the 20 hours, but it, it may be somewhere between the nine and 20 hours. Um, I don't think that the residents are doing all that much when they're logged in that, that's not related to patient care. Uh, I certainly know when I was a resident, if, if I was not doing something related to patient care during my call shift, I'd probably be sleeping and not logged in and doing personal emails or something like that. So, um, and then when I approached the residents with these numbers, you know, they, they said that that sounds right, that they really do feel like they're pinned down to the computer and just, and just tethered to it uh, throughout their call shift. All right. Well, thank you so much for that introduction. And that, that really gives us a little bit more insight. So to start things off, Teresa, if you have any questions for Anthony, by all means. 
Yes, this is a very interesting study and one that I think we all can relate to in, you know, our training and then also watching the residents currently train. And I wonder if you can imagine the role of the on-call resident and what you think has changed uh, specifically related to the EMR. I um, was fortunate enough to do my entire training with the electronic medical record. And so I actually can't imagine a different era. And so can you help us imagine that a little bit? Yeah. And I, I don't want to totally bash on EMR and say that it's all bad, right? EMR has a lot of upside. And, and the main thing is in collecting and displaying data, right? So no longer do residents have to go around and write down all the disparate lab values on the charts that were you know, scattered throughout the hospital. They don't have to go down to the radiology room and gather up all the films to hang them up for the attending. Uh, there's a lot of improvement that can be still done that way. I think it's insane that we still have patients burn compact discs for their imaging. Uh, but you know, a lot of that has been eliminated. And that was some of the, the, the comments we got when we submitted this paper. And, and I do want to, to, to state that, you know, a lot has, has improved in that. I think the downside almost outweighs that, that benefit though. And I think one of the, the main ways you can sum it up is that because the EMR can be accessed from anywhere, it's almost expected that we will be able to access the EMR from anywhere. And it really doesn't allow for any time when you can be away from the EMR, any time when you can you know, step away for any moment because you're always expected to be able to log in, to drop that order, to write that note at any time, at any place. Uh, when I was a resident, we took home call. And I, I remember multiple times when I was, you know, at a grocery store and had to drop everything I was doing because somebody really needed that order at that moment in time. Um, and I just would have to, you know, find a computer and, and be able to log in. So that expectation that the resident is, or the attending even, is able to log in at any place at any time to put that order means that we really have to be tethered to the EMR at all times. And what do you think that does for the on-call resident's role sort of as it relates to patient um, interactions? Specifically, we're interested in obviously, you know, what the patient does at the bedside um, in terms of the, the resident and, and the patient interaction, and then also in the operating room. Do you, do you think that this is indicative of a difference there? Yeah, I think the, the on-call residents are certainly operating less uh, than the on-call residents at our program were in the past, um, just because each patient takes a certain amount of computer time to complete all their patient care-related tasks, right? A note For a new consult, you have to write a note, you have to put admission orders, um, you have to reconcile the MAR, you have to do all these clicks that are involved with patient care. And then every patient that's in the hospital is going to have a certain number of phone calls and patient care tasks associated with that. You're going to you know, have to get that phone call about putting a Tylenol order in at 2 a.m. So you have to log in, find the patient chart, put the Tylenol order in. And the more patients you have on service, the more of those tasks accumulate and add up. Um, and so for, for our residents, and I, and I don't think it is unique to our program, I think this is across uh, different specialties and different programs, it, the, the residents really feel like they are not spending adequate face-to-face -face time with the patients. They're not having the family discussions that they'd like to have, and they're certainly not getting the the OR experience that they'd like. And to that end, um, a lot of programs have obviously benefited greatly from partnership with uh, advanced practice providers. Can you comment on how you think that um, the role of APPs could possibly decrease the EMR um, burden by sharing it amongst providers? Yeah, I think APPs are absolutely essential. And the ACGME really does agree that, that the resident's job is not to be uh, not to be saddled with this administrative burden, that it really should be shared across providers. However, even with the addition of APPs, APPs don't like being tethered to the computer either. And so you're really only shifting the burden to another group of providers. You're not eliminating the burden overall. And so we should really look at what steps can be taken to eliminate that burden. When you just shift it to different APPs, that's just more people that need to be hired. That's more people that you need to pay a salary to, right? And you're not, not, you're not taking care of the underlying problem, which is that there is an extremely inefficient EHR system in most hospitals, that there's a lot of regulatory burden that that, cert, that the people caring for these patients are going to have to meet. And by just shifting it one place or another, you're not really taking care of the underlying problem. There's something called the, the labor productivity curve that if you look at the Bureau of Labor Statistics, they put it out and it shows how many people produce certain units of output across different industries, right? So if you look at how much, how many people it takes to farm your food or create a car, or build a house or whatever, every single industry is showing that there's fewer and fewer people needed to produce a certain output of, of, uh, of unit of work. 
except in healthcare. Healthcare is the exact opposite. You need more people to care for the same amount of patients. And a lot of it is because all we do is we shift the burden somewhere else. We add scribes, we add APPs. I mean, talk to the nurses. The nurses are tethered to the, to the EHR at the bedside too. So they get burnt out. And there's all these administrators that are added on top of that. So yes, I think we should absolutely unburden the residents. And I am 100% in favor of hiring more APPs to take the burden off of them. But the APPs are going to get burned out. They don't like being tethered to the computer. We really need to tackle the underlying problems here. I really love the answer to your question, because as I asked it, I, I was careful about my language of sharing the burden rather than just giving the burden to someone else, right? Because I think your point is a really well taken one about this is a system problem and, and just burning out somebody else is is not the answer to the problem. And certainly as in my role as a uh, chair of the wellness committee in the CNS that that resonates really well. And I, I think it's a it's a really important message to serve hospitals and and systems uh, that this is an, an institutional change that needs to take place. To that end, you know, working obviously within the system that we have, do you think that there or did you see evidence of significant variability be between residents? Like, is it, are there some people that that can just that have this down, right? They they are only spending four hours when everybody else is spending nine. And that's a great question. So we did look at it. We looked at it uh, across the individuals and we looked at it as groups. Um, our in-house residents are PGYs twos and threes. And so we wanted to compare the twos to threes. And we really didn't find that over time that there was an improvement. There was uh, one individual who started off really, really slow and that caught up, but there's a definite ceiling effect. Nobody got good. Everyone kind of leveled off at about this in terms of active time at about 500 minutes per shift. Nobody was able to improve past that. And so there really is a ceiling, no matter how good, how facile you are on the, on the computer. I consider myself pretty computer savvy. I'm pretty good with the computer and I still get bogged down. Um, so no matter, no matter how good you are, there's still a certain number of clicks and you can only click so fast. You can only log in and log out so fast. That's really cathartic to hear that uh, it, it's not just us losing, that there's that there's a real problem here. And I think Brian had some more questions really related to, to drilling down on that. Yeah, I think um, just reading through this and, and being a junior resident, I, I'm very much, uh, this resonated with me a lot just because I, I'm in the thick of it right now. Um, and it's easier, it's easy as a junior resident to um, kind of look at the EHR and, and really point the finger and say that this is the problem, most of the problems that's causing our burnout. Um, but I, I am curious to kind of query all of you guys and, and see what was, what were things like 10 years ago? Um, I know that you guys, uh, Dr. Williamson, you said you, you've kind of your whole career been experienced in the EHR, but Dr. Vega, maybe you could chime in and give us a little insight. How do you think things have changed pre and post EHR? Do you think the burnout rates are similar? Do you think they're different? Mm, yeah, you know, I have a couple thoughts about that, but I'm not too far out to where, you know, I, I've definitely <laughs> used EHR myself throughout the process. But I do remember doing a sub I, you know, back then uh, where I went to an institution in St. Louis and over there they were doing charts, right? And it was just a very cumbersome having to scroll through paper and try to find some note and look at the handwriting and see and try to interpret that. I mean, there was so many issues um, that I recall and nobody was happy about this, you know, and it was a hybrid actually where they had some EHR with the paper at certain places. And it was, there was no question that EHR was so much better, you know, with retrieving, et cetera. So uh, one thing, though, as a trainee uh, that was unique in our uh, place, and I don't know if this is the same as others, but we had um, uh, some really skilled nurses in the ICU that would take orders, you know, uh, verbally uh, to help reduce that burden. They knew if they were calling and asking, hey, can we get you know, uh, GI meds at 2 a.m., right? Uh, that was, you know, or let's switch everything, you know, PO to IV, like they had the ability to do that. And we would co-sign instead of, you know, like it was different and it was very effective, but admittedly, it's not like that at other institutions and there's policies, right? That prevent people from doing it, but we never really had an issue with nurses having, you know, created problems uh, by doing that actually. So 
I don't know. I can keep going on that subject, but uh, at the end of the day, you know, there are a lot of good things about EHR compared to paper and how things are going in the future, but there does need to be some changes. It's interesting that you bring that up because one, I was thinking of the sub I, and I remember at one of the institutions that I sub I, it was the job of the sub I to take a paper binder of lab numbers, I believe, and then type them into from like one system to another system. So <laughs> it's kind of wild to have uh, to reflect on the evolution of the way the EHR or the EMR has worked for us. I think um, your point is a really well taken one about because I remember that too when I was a junior resident having, you know, co-signing orders in the morning or even when we were writing a note, like I actually can think about the way the note has evolved throughout from sort of my junior residency on and the more features that have to be included. And even though it's templated, you know, there is there is just a lot that that needs to be when it comes to morbidity, mortality, documentation, all of those things um, that sort of come from. And I'd, I'd love to hear Anthony's opinion of how that has kind of played a role, because that's one thing that I've certainly seen evolve is like the amount of of things that need to go into the EMR seems to only grow rather than get smaller. Yeah. How many times have you heard an administrator institute a new program that will reduce the number of clicks? It's rare, right? It's it's always adding to them. Um, you know, on the subject of order entry, I think that is someplace that EMR really, really suffers, right? So if you're going to, back in the days of paper charts, order an MRI brain, you write down MRI brain without contrast, it takes you two seconds, right? <clears throat> Doing it on an EMR, I timed it once. It's, it's about 95 seconds and it's about 60 clicks or keystrokes to order an MRI. Uh, brain, you know, you have to put in, you have to find the chart, you have to associate an ICD-10, you have to fill out all those stop signs, you have to go through the appropriate use criteria pop-up that comes up. So it's really burdensome on, on order entry. So I think going to to a way of maybe more embracing verbal orders um, could be uh, could be a way to reduce that burden. And really, there has has been very little guidance from CMS. When, when EMRs are rolled out under the um, uh, Affordable Care Act and, and pre that, the CMS issued guidelines saying that there should be computer physician order entry, CPOE, uh, but they didn't, really didn't say what that meant. They didn't really say if it should be all orders are put in by a physician or if it should be a certain uh, percentage of orders uh, or what the safety is behind verbal orders. And so I think that's something that should be studied and there should be really more guidance on that. How safe are verbal orders? It'd be pretty easy to do a randomized study to, to see if verbal orders are safe or not. I think they're pretty safe. Um, and you could certainly integrate into EMR, uh, you know, a voice recording if the nurse calls you up on the phone, just have the EMR record your voice saying you wanted this. So if there's ever a medical legal question, you know, you have the, the physician's voice embedded into the chart. Um, and then in terms of documentation, you know, the, there's so many things that we have to document for, right? So there's the CPT guidelines in order to bill for your ENM notes uh, that have to include certain documentation uh uh, aspects. And then there's the quality metrics that, that and the DRGs that the hospital wants us to document for so that they can increase their value-based reimbursement so they can increase their DRG reimbursement. And again, this is someplace that there's a top-down approach. There's excessive regulation that CMS could really, if they wanted to scale that back, could scale back the amount of documentation that's required for these DRGs and these value-based metrics. They could certainly integrate AI to better you know, figure out how sick the patient is rather than us having to document hyponatremia, protein calorie malnutrition, just figure out an AI algorithm that could do that instead of, of burdening the physician with it. I have another question. Um, I think a great point you've made during this discussion and in this uh, this paper is that your objective here was not to vilify the EHR. Uh, rather, it's just to point out, is there possible flaws and ways that we can improve upon it? And one of those uh, objective metrics that you you uh, presented was the amount of cases have steadily gone up at, at UCSF. Um, but those, and correct me if I'm wrong, but those were for just senior or lead residents, correct? Do you think that that's translated as well into the junior residents? Are they operating more as well and getting more operative experience or is, rather is the administrative work of having more seniors operating being pushed onto them? No, our residents really have a great operative volume. So whenever they, they're not on call, uh, they're doing multiple cases a day. So there's a really, really good operative volume. You know, that that senior and lead resident is based on the um, ACGME case logs that you fill out. And so, you know, even if you're a junior resident, you can still put lead resident, right? Okay. As long as you're the only resident in the case. Okay. Got it. Um, so, I mean, you, you've really presented us with, with multiple... Um, solutions to 
I guess these these flaws that you're seeing here. Um, but do you think that there's any changes in how we as residents can specifically interact with the EHR? Do you have any suggestions on that end? So if my advice was to residents, it would be, you know, learn to meditate and, and deep breathe and, and learn to control the things that you can control and, and try not to get too frustrated about the things you can't control. Um, one of the things I did as a resident is I, I tried to get on some of the committees um, that had control over the HR. So when that, that topic right. came up of adding a new, you know, checkbox or a new click box to the HR, I could at least raise my hand and say, please don't do that. That's just going to be create needless work. Um, so certainly get on committees. And then I think, you know, if you're at an institution that has the ability to do this, it was, it really wasn't that difficult for us to pull these audit logs. Um, and I really think that more institutions could do this because again, the, the point of our paper was to identify this. Um, and I think if that's something that more institutions did more programs, uh, took ownership of, we could start seeing these trends and we could really judge whether or not these, there's any um, benefit to some of the interventions or if there's downsides to more of these interventions and, and we could really track how many clicks are being added and how much the HR burden is changing over time. To that end, do you have any future directions of this study or you know, if you're picking an intervention to study, are you willing to give us a sneak peek? Uh, yeah, so we're the the way next way we're going is we want to look and see how the burden is among other providers. So I, I do want to look at the APPs and the attendings and the fellows as well. Um, and I really want to see, you know, what's the total burden across the service. Um, so not just the on-call resident, but how much how much does that burden go across the service? And then I would absolutely love to try some interventions. Um, you know, th there's stuff that can come from the bottom up. There's stuff that can be done at this institutional level. And there's stuff that, again, comes from, you know, the CMS or, or federal government that really would take uh, a lot of more uh, activity from our, our national body, from the Washington Committee, for example, to uh, to try to fix some of these problems. Well, that's great. You know, thank you so much. And and I think that kind of uh, uh, boils us down to time. But, you know, I wanted to really take the moment to thank you for talking about this subject that's uh, kind of unique, uh, that's not really, you know, published this often. Uh, but uh, thank you, Anthony, Brian, and Teresa for your time. And uh, the CNS thanks you. And of course, please log on to cns.org and uh, you have access to be able to uh, take CME credit uh, um, for each of these podcasts. Um, so thank you again, and, uh, and we wish you a good day.